Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. Hey Boards Insiders, this is Nick Nissen, a psychiatry resident and co-founder of Inside the Boards. You may have heard of my podcast, Brain Health with Dr. Nissen. In this ITB collaboration episode, we're going to combine my show with ITB to discuss psychiatry and neurology, as well as a new field on the forefront of psychiatry, optogenetics. Stay listening to the end to learn about how optogenetics is showing us how to control the mind using just light. Let's begin with a question breakdown from our all audio cue bank. A nine-year-old boy presents to his primary care office with his mother who has noticed behavioral changes over the past three months. His teachers have made multiple complaints about his inattentive behavior and state that he often daydreams in class and stares off into space, sometimes not responding to his name for several seconds. The patient's mother has noticed similar occurrences at home, but attributed them to a poor attention span. The patient achieves good grades and completes his homework every night. He has no problems getting along with his siblings or other children in his class. Physical exam is unremarkable, and he responds appropriately to questioning. The medication used to treat the most likely diagnosis has which of the following mechanisms of action? Is it A, acts as an agonist at alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, B, modulates firing of neuronal voltage-dependent sodium channels, C, prevents packaging of catecholamines into presynaptic vesicles? Or is it D, reduces T-type calcium channel conduction? And the correct answer is D, reduces T-type calcium channel conduction. This patient is likely suffering from absence seizures, which occur primarily in children. These seizures involve sudden loss of consciousness without loss of muscle tone and with no post-ictal state. These patients will suddenly pause for several seconds during which they will not respond to any stimulus. They will then spontaneously regain consciousness and will be unaware of the seizure. Often, these seizures are misdiagnosed as ADHD as the loss of consciousness for several seconds is interpreted as being inattentive. First-line treatment is ethosuximide, which works by blocking T-type calcium channels. Hey everyone, welcome to Brain Health with Dr. Nissen. In this show, we explore the universe's great unknown, the human brain. In my reflections and interviews with guests, we'll go to the forefront of psychiatry, neuroscience, nutrition, and medicine to see how we can enhance our mental health sharpen our cognition, and reach better performance. This is Brain Health, and I'm Dr. Nissen. Let's dive right in. So welcome to the show. I'm here with Dr. Fenno. Dr. Fenno is originally from Alaska and received his MD, PhD at Stanford, where he is now a resident physician in the research track for psychiatry. And Dr. Fenno and I had met at Stanford, and he gave a talk about optogenetics, which is what we'll be talking about today. So I wanted to orient people uh, in this talk about you know this this field of optogenetics, what is going on in uh, in this research, and and what some possible future clinical implications might be. I think you might find it. Uh, to be a fascinating conversation. I certainly found it to be fascinating when I first heard Dr. Fenno talk about this. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Fenno. Hey, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the work that we've been doing at Stanford and optogenetics in particular. So happy to explain optogenetics. So let me, let me put it in context, though. If we think about ways traditionally that have been available to modulate the brain, so to change brain function, you know, those largely fall into two categories. One of them is electricity, which, you know, going back all the way to Luigi Galvani, his original experiments with frogs attaching, you know, electrodes to frog muscles and seeing that that was sufficient to make them dance, you know, has, has come a long way. We now use uh, electrical modulation frequently in the brain 
So you can think of DBS as one of the classic applications. So deep brain stimulation, which is used frequently for movement disorders, especially Parkinson's disease, where you place electrodes very precisely in the brain. For those of you becoming neurosurgeons, perhaps this will be a little too simplistic, but you put electrodes in the brain, you turn them on, they modulate specific parts of the movement pathway, and then you have some sort of therapeutic benefit to the patient. So you know, electricity is, has the advantage of being very precise in time. So you turn it on, you turn it off, the electricity turns on, it turns off. You know, you can even modulate uh, these electrodes during the surgery to figure out what the optimal parameters are going to be. So one of the ways that we can modulate neurons in the brain tissue is with electricity, and it's really specific based on time. So what's the other way that we can modulate brain activity? The other is using medications, so using drugs. Mm -hmm. And medications modify the brain or modify brain activity on a different time scale, right? So the patient takes a pill, the pill is digested, it's absorbed, it spreads throughout the blood, maybe it's metabolized, it gets to the brain eventually, it has this slow peak onset of serum and plasma concentration, it binds to specific receptors in the brain, which is how it gets its specificity. Um, it's on for a period of time, and then as the body metabolizes it, you know, the therapeutic effect wears off. And so someone takes a medication you know, once a month, once a week, once a day, two times a day, three times a day, four times a day, et cetera. Um, and so the, the real advantage of using medication for modulating brain activity is a specificity that electricity does not have, right? So by, by virtue of the you know, agonist, antagonist, ligand, receptor binding, you can choose which neurons you want to modulate, although you lose that advantage of time. So, you know, up until around you know, early 2000s, 2004, 2005, these were the mainstays not only for clinical work, but also in experimental neuroscience. So when we were working in the lab, we would also use, you know, drugs, we would use electricity, you know, with some somewhat different um, implementations, but essentially the same modality. So, you know, electricity, which is very precise in time, but you can't really mm -hmm. choose which neurons you're going to modulate. Mm -hmm. Chemicals, where you can choose which neurons by virtue of their receptors or other, you know, inherent properties, um, but less of the temporal control. Okay, so electricity offered the temporal specificity, but you might be stimulating some of the neurons that you don't really want to stimulate. And with drugs, you could focus specifically on some of the different receptors that you want to act on or neurotransmitters. Um, so they're specific in that regard, but over the time scale, they weren't so specific. So how does optogenetics come into this? Optogenetics is really a, a technique and a technology that has the best aspects of both of those and allows us to very precisely modify the activity of defined populations of neurons precisely in time. <clears throat> and the way this works is that we use microbial opsins. So by microbial opsins, I mean proteins, mm -hmm. you know, proteins that are transcribed from genes that come from single-celled organisms. And these are widely found throughout nature. They're found in bacteria. They're found in algae. Recently, they've even been found in some viruses. Um, and they're membrane proteins, so they sit in the membrane. And what they do is they transduce light, so certain mm -hmm. wavelengths of visible light, into the movement of ions. So if you think about what that means, you have this protein that's sitting in the membrane of a cell, a single cell. Light comes in and then you know, it either opens a channel or if it's a pump, these are the two types, channels and pumps, it moves ions from one side of the membrane to the other. Mm -hmm. So that these have been known for a while. They've been known since you know, some German biophysicists did a lot of work on these back in the 70s and the 80s. It was kind of an interesting phenomenon. Uh, but the bright idea was connecting the fact that these use light to change concentrations of ions mm -hmm. and connecting that idea, that principle, with the fact that neurons also use gradients of ions to control communication. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the action potential as the fundamental unit of communication in neurons. And the action potential is essentially a changing in the membrane potential, the voltage across the membrane, in response to the movement of ions. So the upswing mm -hmm. of the action potential is the movement of sodium from outside of the neuron to inside of the neuron, repolarization largely due to potassium moving from inside the neuron to outside the neuron. So the, the thought was, and the hypothesis, was that if we take these 
membrane proteins, these membrane ion channels and ion pumps mm -hmm. from single celled organisms. And if we can get those to express in the membrane of mammalian neurons, so you know, different chunk of, the, um, of the, the life spectrum here, if we can get those in the membranes of neurons, it is possible that if we shine light on those neurons, they'll have the same effect where the channel will open or the pump will move through the pumping cycle to move, neuron, or move ions across the membrane. So by using these ionopores and expressing them in the neurons of mammalian brains, we would be able to gain control over which neurons are specifically activated and when. And so, you know, the original work that was done here at Stanford, I think it was in 2005 uh, by Ed Boyden, Carl Dyseroff, Feng Zhang, a few others, was to do exactly that. So to take a um, gene called channel rhodopsin, and it was the second variant, channel rhodopsin 2, or CHR2, as it's widely known, which comes from an algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardi, which grows all over the place. You've probably had it on your shoes before. Um, <laughs> take that gene, express it in cultured neurons, so neurons that are growing in a dish, patch them using whole cell electrophysiology, which is when you take a needle, a small glass needle, you put it inside the neuron, you can directly measure changes to the membrane potential including action potentials, and then shine light on them and see what happens. And lo and behold, you know, it worked. It works right out of the gate. And not only that, it works incredibly well. By that, mm. I mean, you can take it, put mm. it in neurons, shine light on them, and they just fire action potentials. So the channel mm. is very efficient. Um, and that's, that's the basic premise of optogenetics, is we're using these microbial channels, microbial pumps, these single-celled organism genes. We take them. We do some molecular magic to optimize them to work in mammals. Mm -hmm. And then we put them into neurons, we can turn them on, which is half of the coin. Shortly thereafter, we wanted to be able to turn neurons off, right? So if we turn them on, you can mm -hmm. ask questions of sufficiency. Like, is it enough to cause something to happen if I turn these neurons on? And we can do that by causing these action potentials using optogenetics. Um, the flip side of that is asking questions about necessity, like what happens if I turn neurons off? Are the, is the activity of these neurons necessary for something to happen? And so to do that, um, a different microbial opsin mm -hmm. uh, called NPHR was discovered. It's from a single-celled organism called Natronomonas pharynopsis which I believe lives in uh, the Dead Sea. So it lives in very high salinity environments. Mm -hmm. um, and it is not a channel, right? So channel rhodopsin inherent in the name, it's a channel. This one is actually an ion pump. Okay. And it is selective for chloride ions. And so it pumps chloride ions from outside the cell to inside the cell. Mm. Um, and you know, its natural function is actually to maintain osmotic homeostasis in this organism. Mm -hmm. But we can co-opt this same activity in our, our neurons to turn them off. If we pump a bunch of chloride from outside of the neuron to inside the neuron, think about like the activity of GABA, for instance. Right. Inhibitory like neurotransmitter. Exactly. Yeah. Um, is going to be a net hyperpolarization of the membrane potential. It's going to make it more negative, less likely to fire an action potential. And again, this is exactly what happened. So we can take these genes, we can optimize them. Um, for use in mammals, if we put them into neurons, it turns the neuron off in response to light. And so, you know, so far we have now a tool to turn neurons on and a tool to turn them off. Um, and that's enough to ask some of the fundamental questions in neuroscience about necessity and sufficiency of activity and to do it in a targeted way because these are genes. So coming back to our original question about or our observation about electricity and, and chemicals, about mm -hmm. pharmacological agents. So these have the best of both worlds in that they are very precise because they're genes. So we can choose which neurons to put them into, which mm -hmm. neurons to express them in, um, thereby having the, the specificity similar to like a, a drug, like um, 
you know, levodopa, for instance, or something like that. Right. Um, but so we just, also can control them very precisely in time by turning the light on and off, similar to electricity. Yeah. Okay. So that sort of brings it full circle of, of you know, how this compares to the other options we have of uh, electricity and drugs, where electricity, it's very time specific, but not very specific over a space or what, um, you know, what neurons are trying to act on. And then drugs that act more specifically on neurons, but that uh, have a different time horizon. Exactly. Yeah. So this, this combines the best properties of both of these, these options mm -hmm. um, of electricity and of pharmacological agents. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that was not intuitive about this, but that turned out to be true, is that there has to be some sort of light sensing molecule, right? The proteins, right. these proteins are not inherently sensitive to light. And as it turns out, you know, nature has, has reused the same approach multiple times. So in our eyes, we also have rhodopsins, right? We mm -hmm. have the, the light sensing proteins in our eyes that work differently than these. You know, the ones in our eyes are G protein coupled receptors. They work via second messenger cascades. But the, the beautiful um, observation is that both the rhodopsins in our eyes, which are mm -hmm. G protein coupled receptors, and these microbial opsins, which are membrane embedded ion channels and ion pumps, use the same light sensing molecule. So they both use vitamin A, so retinol, okay. um, which is you know half a beta carotene, which is why you should eat your carrots for your eyesight. Mm -hmm. um, but that in and of itself is not an assumption that could be made. There are other light sensing proteins in nature that use cofactors that are not present in the mammalian brain. Mm -hmm. So as it so happened, there is enough vitamin A present naturally throughout the brain that we can take these tools put them in any chunk of the brain we want. You can mm -hmm. put them in the midbrain, the brainstem, the peripheral nervous system, the cortex, even the retina. And there's enough vitamin A naturally that's just in the milieu that they function. Um, and, and that's those, true in man. Yeah. Those give the light sens sensitivity to these rhodopsin or to turning off. Is the MPHR also light sensitive? Yeah, exactly. So the the NPHR, channel rhodopsin, all the microbial opsins use this same retinal mm -hmm. in order to, to sense light. And okay. that, that coupling between the vitamin A moiety between retinal and the protein, the opsin, is a process that happens spontaneously. And so if mm -hmm. they're in the same spot, then they covalently attach to each other. Yeah, that is pretty um, nifty. It's pretty great. And, you know, the other, other thing that goes along with this is that they're sensitive to visible wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. um, and another beautiful um, inherent property of the optogenetic tools is that not only are they inherently sensitive to visible wavelengths, but they're sensitive to different visible wavelengths. So channel mm -hmm. rhodopsin, for instance, is sensitive to blue light specifically and not as much to red light, whereas NPHR, the chloride pump, is responsive to yellow and orange light mm -hmm. and not as much to blue light. And so one of the observations that was made was you can then potentially use these in the same space, in the same neuron, to be able to turn neurons on with one color of light mm -hmm. and off with another color of light. And so then in order to uh, intervene in a mammal, you have to do this, you have to incorporate these in some sort of gene therapy to then have them expressed in the neurons, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, in our model organisms, in my, like, a uh, huge cohort of mice or rats or zebrafish, flies, worms, um, marmosets, etc. cetera, the, the genes have to be delivered similar to any other gene therapy because mm -hmm. we're expressing a protein that's not native. So we have a lot of tricks to do this in our model organisms. Um, we can either stably modify the genome to create a transgenic animal um, or more so, more popular now is using viruses to deliver the gene. Um, so the virus that's typically used, the workhorse virus, both in human gene therapy as well as in our model organisms, is a virus that's called AAV, or adeno-associated virus, um, which is a virus that is very small. The genome is around 8,000 base pairs, um, and it occurs naturally widely. We've probably all been infected with it. Um, but it's very safe. It has a DNA genome, and it's easy to modify, and so we use that in our laboratory um, work. And that's also, as I mentioned, commonly used in gene therapy in humans, as common as gene therapy is. And in fact, there are currently two 
human clinical trials, two stage one trials using optogenetic tools. Um, in this case, for a certain kind of congenital, or not congenital, but heritable blindness mm -hmm. um, called retinitis pigmentosum. And so those are using um, adeno associated vectors to deliver various optogenetic tools um, to neurons in the retina that are not normally sensitive to light in order to sensitize them to light. Mm -hmm. um, and these, this is a disease where we have um, very good uh, preclinical models um, where the mutations in humans that cause blindness uh, cause a similar phenotype in, in uh, rodents, in mice, and in rats. Mm. And in uh, rats, it's been consistently shown that taking this approach restores at least discriminative vision. And so that's the, the goal for these clinical trials. Okay. I'm not involved in them, but that's, that's what I know about them. Okay. And so in these clinical trials, then the vector then is it's able to deliver this genetic material without the cells themselves needing to develop with the genetic material from the start. That's correct. And so that, that was something that was sort of unclear to me at, at the beginning. It was like, yeah. would you need to introduce the genetic material while somebody's a fetus or in the womb or something in order to have it expressed? That's a really good point. And so neurons are challenging because they're mostly senescent, right? So neurons mm -hmm. don't divide. Right. So it's, it's more difficult to make permanent changes. Um, AAV is not a retrovirus. So the, broadly, the two types of viruses that are commonly used um, in the laboratory space, one's a retrovirus. Um, and that variety of virus stably integrates into the genome, mm -hmm. um, which gives you stable expression but you know, has the potential for oncogenesis, depending on where that virus lands in the genome. You know, if that virus happens to land in a space where it perturbs um, you know, some sort of um, cell cycle inhibitor, or you could think it could have some proto-oncogenic effect. AAV, um, it does have one site in the genome where it integrates, but it's a defined site, but otherwise is maintained outside of the genome. So it, it actually mostly turns into a big circle of DNA. Mm -hmm and just hangs out. And so in that way, it's actually ideal for use in um, non-dividing cells because the virus itself is replication deficient. It's not a, okay. it's not a live virus. Um, so if you were to deliver it to cells that were dividing, over time you would dilute out the copy number. In the case of um, terminally divided cells, senescent cells like neurons, you know, once you deliver this payload, it's going to stay there. And what we know from animal studies, um, is that it, it stays there for a very long period of time, stably, without killing the, the cells. And okay. so at least a year, probably longer. That's kind of the time, end of the timeline for most rodent studies. Okay. So there are these opsin channels that can be used to activate the cells. And then there are these MPHR channels that can be used to mm -hmm. inactivate cells or inhibit neurotransmission. And then they can be introduced with a vector and in order, though, to have the stimulation occur with light, how can that be done non-invasively? Or is it only done invasively? Yeah, that is a great question. So optogenetics has spurred um, <clears throat> a lot of material science research mm. um, that is helping to address this. So in, our rod in rodents, um, we typically implant fiber optic cables, so very small fiber optics, like mm -hmm. 200 microns is the typical one, but mm -hmm. it's an invasive procedure. So you're, you're doing rodent neurosurgery, you make a craniotomy, you implant a fiber, you cement it in place, and it stays there. Um, not too dissimilar from having a, a DBS a electrode scene, yeah. permanently implanted, but suboptimal if there's an alternative. And so there have been two avenues of engineering work to try to uh, create non-invasive optogenetic modulation. So one of these is on the material science side, um, which has come in parallel with miniaturization and the cost decrease in manufacturing LEDs. You might've noticed mm -hmm. like LED light bulbs are in, like everything's got a light on it now. It's because LED uh, manufacturing uh, technology has come a very long way in the last 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, not only has it gotten cheaper to make with more colors important for optogenetics, but it's also become easier to fabricate tiny LEDs, micro LEDs. Mm. I'd have heard of OEL LEDs. There's also non-organic LEDs. 
Um, and so some of these are able to be actually injected in the brain. They're 25 microns in diameter. They're very, very small and they require very little power to run. And so that's, that's one approach. There's been some other material science that uses interesting nanoparticles that can be either charged or can convert infrared light um, into visible wavelengths of light. And so there's, there's all these kind of interesting materials approaches. I don't know how close those are to translational use. They're used occasionally, but it's more on the early research side. Yeah. I think the more, um, more useful and, and closer to prime time approach has actually been engineering the optogenetic tools themselves. So we're talking about synthetic biology and bioengineering approaches. And it, it takes advantage of an observation uh, that has to do with light. And so when I mentioned earlier, you know, these, these things work based on different colors of light. Channel rhodopsin works based on blue light. NPHR works based on yellow light. There's actually, you know, now hundreds of these tools. And some, they have different selectivities for ions. They have different spectral sensitivities, meaning they're sensitive to different types of, uh, different wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. um, and what we know from a lot of unrelated work is that the more red shifted the wavelength of the light is, mm -hmm. the less that it scatters in brain tissue. Mm -hmm. And so if you use blue light, it actually is readily scattering and that has a lot to do with the, the lipid composition of the brain. Uh, it's the main light scattering portion. There's also a bunch of inherently absorbent molecules like NADH or NAD+, FAD, et cetera. But the more red shifted we get, the closer to infrared, the more that light can penetrate the brain without scattering. Hmm. So that, what that practically does is it allows us to have our light source much further from the region of the brain we want to stimulate. Hmm. And that's, that's one of the engineering aims. So we've taken and we've shifted the spectral sensitivity of a lot of these opsins very close to infrared wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And there appears to be an inherent cutoff that has to do with retinal as far mm -hmm. as which wavelengths retinal can absorb when it's attached to an opsin. So mm -hmm. we're getting very close to that theoretical limitation. The other advance we've made is making the opsins themselves more sensitive to light. Mm -hmm. So making it more likely that they're going to open if they're a channel or move through their pumping cycle if they're a pump in response to a single photon of light. Mm -hmm. So what that does practically is it means we need now less light power, so fewer photons per area. Mm -hmm. So think about just like you need, you know, a dimmer bulb essentially to get right. the same effect. And so if we put those two things together, redshifting the wavelength of the opsin mm -hmm. and increasing the sensitivity, it now allows us to move the light source actually dramatically further away than we originally needed. Um, in order to get the same kinds of behavioral effects and the same kinds of modulation of neuron activities. And so in um, rodents now, in rats, we can have the fiber placed on the dura wow. um, and stimulate um, brain matter that's you know, six, uh, seven, eight millimeters um, away from that. Yeah. Which if you scale that up to a human brain, that's not a ton of space, mm -hmm. um, unless you're thinking about, for instance, cortex. So cortex is you know, close to the dura, it, it has a thickness that's a bit thicker than, you know, a centimeter, but is, is on a sim similar order of magnitude. Um, this is also separately important as we think about scaling up these approaches for use in mammals with larger brain volumes, mm -hmm. because that same scattering problem is going to be an Achilles heel um, for any sort of optogenetic tool that needs, you know, a highly scattering wavelength like blue light and also needs a lot of that light to be activated is that we will only be able to stimulate a small volume in the brain. Whereas in humans and non-human primates, it's uh, likely to be that we need to stimulate a large volume of brain. And so, you know, having these newer opsins, uh, which are both engineered, sourced naturally, and a combination thereof um, that are more sensitive to light and more sensitive to red wavelengths of light mm -hmm. has, has dramatically increased um, both the volume of brain that we can stimulate and the distance that we can put between, you know, equivalent, essentially a light bulb or an LED or a laser and the region of the brain that we want to manipulate. Yeah. So, so kind of zooming out for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, for people who are 
um, in the medical world or not in the medical world. I, I think I've seen it, you know, shown in the media before is optogenetics is, is sort of a form of mind control because mostly with that one video of the rat that was able to go in a circle from mm -hmm. stimulating, was it the the right side of the brain and then it, it went in circles in the left or something like that? And, and the, the idea being that you can, um, you know, activate neurons and, and change the behavior of, of, a, of a mammal um, and that that may have implications in the future for humans. Was I right about the, the rat experiment? Was it? Yeah, so it's a yeah, it's stimulating motor cortex. You can go on YouTube and see this. You search for channel rhodopsin, then it should be the first video that pops up. It's like a, yeah. it's a classic so, video. Yeah. So then talking about um, you know these implications, you're saying that, first of all, been finding that with more red-shifted light, you can achieve more uh, stimulation of these rhodopsins, and then the, the opsins have also be, become more sensitive to the light, mm -hmm. so you can stimulate them from further out. Uh, and one thing that I was thinking about is you know, that there is some degree of translucency to bone, and is there any hope or, or thoughts that somehow in the future the sensitivity could be increased enough that a bright light held directly against a thinner part of the skull, perhaps like the temporal bone. I, I remember there being particularly thin pieces there. If if that could happen, or if you had too much sensitivity, also then maybe the the environment surrounding you would be able to stimulate different brain areas. Yeah, I, these are great questions. So, starting with the mind control question, which I like a lot. Um, definitely, it's definitely a form of of mind control. It's mm -hmm. in the same category of mind control as you know, DBS electrodes and as pharmacological agents are. So mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say so. I mean, that's, that's actually what it's mainly used for. And here I'm taking, you know, a, a wide view of what mind control means. I'm not talking about like voodoo zombies. I'm not talking about uh, Manchurian candidate style mind control. What I'm talking about is precision intervention where we can say, what is a pathological circuit in mm -hmm. the brain and instead of having to hammer that if you think about like taking anti-epileptics right um, which work very well for tamping down on the frequency of seizures but have unintended side effects of you know essentially hyperpolarizing the rest of the brain mm -hmm. um, so by mind control here precision mind control i'm saying like you know you could take and we've done this in in bottle organisms is pick out specific components of pre-chosen circuits in the brain and modulate them precisely in time to achieve a desired therapeutic outcome. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is a, a kind of mind control that we need, right. right? If we want to call it mind control. I think the other, other way to describe it would be, you know, precision medicine is one that's thrown around or personalized medicine, et cetera, where instead of a one size fits all approach, you, know, you can really say in this particular patient, what is the problem and what do we need to do to fix it? Mm -hmm. And it really expands the palette of options that are available. Right. It's, it's been instrumental. This approach has been instrumental in, and I think as you're alluding to, in illustrating the role of specific circuits as they relate to particular behaviors, both in health and disease, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it meets a, you know, a, an NIMH goal and an NIH criteria of trying to shift away from, you know, if you're, have done your psychiatry rotation or interest in psychiatry, like shifting away from behavioral diagnoses mm -hmm. for psychiatric disease and moving towards a more circuit-based understanding. And right. so this, this is a technology that has been instrumental and foundational in being able to understand the relationship between the activity of defined circuits in the brain and behaviors, both pathological and, and natural. So what are some of the non-invasive techniques that we're able to use to use light to stimulate the brain in the realm of optogenetics. And so what we can do currently is we, we can actually stimulate with wavelengths that would be able to penetrate bone. So we can, we oh, can wow. use something called two photon stimulation, which uses a, essentially it's like a alchemy of optical physics where you can take two photons of one particular wavelength, shoot them towards each other, and where they are incident together, they will spontaneously um, sum together using a particular math that is beyond my comprehension um, to create a photon 
that has actually a higher energy state. And mm -hmm. higher energy state means that it's more blue shifted. Mm -hmm. And so we can use infrared photons. We're talking like 800, 900, 1100 nanometers. Yeah. We can use a, a particular microscope that shoots them from two different beam paths into a particular spot in the brain. And they will combine in that spot into, let's say, a green photon or a blue mm -hmm. photon and have the effect of activating the opsin without activating anything in the beam path, because again, mm -hmm. infrared light on its own doesn't activate any optogenetic tools um, and with less scattering. This is a technology that is not currently scalable for use in anywhere except a, a laboratory uh, space, right. an experimental space. Um, and then the other approach um, that's possible is using some of the particles I mentioned earlier. So some of the material science uh, alchemy where they have these upconverting nanoparticles, which do something similar. They absorb a certain number of photons of a lower energy wavelength, and then they emit photons that are of a higher energy. And so mm -hmm. they, they absorb infrared and they emit in the visible, and those are tunable. Their quantum yield is very, very low, which means you need a lot of, you need a very bright infrared bulb. And so those are not ready for prime time. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that despite that, you know, as, as these two clinical trials illustrate, there are portions of the brain that are more accessible yeah. um, naturally. And so the eye, you know, the retina is probably the most accessible portion of the central nervous system. It's right, you right. Know, right there. Light obviously gets to it very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also consider, for instance, like the inner ear might be one. Mm -hmm. You can consider the especially nose. the peripheral nervous system. Mm. Um, so pain nerves, you know, motor nerves, um, things where you could use a nerve cuff, which has been described uh, multiple times that you implant permanently in the peripheral nervous system in order to stimulate or inhibit certain types of sensory or motor neurons. Mm. Um, and then that brings you to the spinal cord. So you know, there's a lot of interest in using some of these precise tools, optogenetic tools, in order to address um, some of the sequelae of spinal cord injury, such as mm -hmm. paralysis, chronic pain, mm -hmm. um, you know, desensitization. And so there, the, you know, we want to talk about the midbrain, the deep nuclei of the brain. You know, those are currently beyond the reach of some of the less invasive approaches to mm -hmm. optical stimulation. Um, but, you know, the body is a big landscape. There's a lot of other, other parts that are, you know, not um, exceedingly beyond the reach of technologies that we have today. Yeah. Well, you just talked about, I think, some of the different possible implications and how this could help people, um, naming some of those, like spinal cord injuries, for instance. Uh, you talked about the trials that are happening with retinitis pigmentosum. Are there other sort of ways that you see how this can really help people that really get you really excited about it that we haven't touched upon yet? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the work that I talked about was pioneered in the Dyseroth lab, so Carl Dyseroth lab. So Carl Dyseroth right. is a psychiatrist. I'm a psychiatrist. A lot of different psychiatrists come through the lab and are really excited about these approaches um, for psychiatric disease. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's three, three main ways that these are applicable to psychiatric disease. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first is really just understanding more about how the brain works normally. Like when we think about psychiatric disease, you think about, you know, if you ask, if you, if you pull 10 people and they ask their, you know, second cousin what they think about psychiatry, it's going to be Freud, it's going to be quackery, it's going to be not a medical doctor, et cetera, right? So we, right. you know, psychiatry has only recently started to catch up with the rest of modern medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and some psychiatrists might take issue with that characterization, which is totally fine. But, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about, you know, psychiatric drugs, we're talking about the last 50 years, if we're thinking about diagnosis, we're using behavior and we're slowly moving over to circuit descriptions. And I, I think a lot of that is because we don't have a fundamental understanding of a lot of how the brain works. Mm -hmm. And so using optogenetic tools in order to understand more about how the brain works normally. I'd say that's the first way. The second way is to create disease models of psychiatric disease. So most psychiatric diseases, many psychiatric diseases have a large heritable component to them, mm -hmm. but there's no single gene, right? There's no, you know, synuclein mutation, like for Parkinson's disease, you know, there's right. no EPO, EPO A4, whatever, for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. You know, we don't have the same kind of 
genotype phenotype relationships for most psychiatric diseases. But what we do have is we have consistent observations for how certain parts of the brain change as far as the way information moves through circuits or the way that certain neural activity changes. And we can use these tools to replicate that in laboratory models to create disease models that we otherwise would not have. Mm -hmm. That gives us access to then drug screening platforms to other interventional approaches. Hmm. So creating new disease models using these techniques. And then the last way is with direct therapeutic, therapeutic intervention. So, you know, I highlighted the two trials that we have so far for retinitis pigmentosa, but thinking about, you know, what can we do for patients who have intractable addiction? Can mm -hmm. we modulate, you know, circuitry that involves the nucleus accumbens? What do we do in the striatum? What do we do for patients who have, you know, schizophrenia and autism? And you know, we mm -hmm. have drugs that work fairly well for some people, but mostly for, you know, negative symptoms in, in the case of schizophrenia. And we don't right. really have any drugs for autism spectrum disorders, but we know that there are certain circuit abnormalities that are consistent um, and that change with therapeutic intervention in the case of, of schizophrenia. And so being able to have these kinds of targeted approaches to modify brain activity um, in order to treat psychiatric disease. I think that's the, that's the thing I'm most excited about. Um, we have a ways to go, but the progress that has been made over the last 10 to 15 years is just mind blowing. You know, it's right. a phenomenal amount of progress to go from using electrodes and using chemicals um, to try to patch together a story about what's happening in the brain to being able to take awake behaving animals, as you mentioned, turn on a light and watch them run in a circle. Right. Turn on a light and watch them, or watch them press a lever for a light. Turn off pain. And you know, beyond the central nervous system, like you can think about cardiac pacing. Mm -hmm. you know, we can we can modulate cardiac activity. You can modulate muscle activity. So being able to s make these changes so precisely has has really driven our knowledge forward. Both fundamental knowledge, um, knowledge of different disease states, and now already moving into the therapeutic realm. So I, I think that kind of progress is 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 just incredible. And it makes me very excited about where this is going to go over the next you know five to ten years. Thank you for that awesome exploration of optogenetics, Dr. Fenno. Uh, to wrap things up, I wanted to ask you, what are your keys to brain health in your life, be it mental health, cognitive enhancement, or just optimizing performance? What do you find to be something uh, that is really helpful in optimizing your brain health? Ah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, I can tell you what I do to try to stay stay sane every day, which is, you know, in the morning I get up and I think about three things I'm excited about and it gives me a positive attitude for the day. Mm -hmm. and I try to exercise. I think exercise has been shown consistently to be, you know, the one thing that, that drops out as far as things you can, you can do to improve your mood. Mm -hmm. You can, uh, that we recommend to people to try to uh, maintain uh, brain health in the long term. Um, you know, I'm, I have no plans to express optogenetic tools in my brain to try to improve my brain health overall. <laughs> um, but, you know, as someone who, and we didn't talk a lot about it, but in the clinical side, I mostly work in addiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that consistently impresses me in the patients that I work with is how much happier they are and how much happier they say they are with changes to their their substance use and so um you know one of the i work in on a lemke's clinic she's a you know runs the the dual diagnosis clinic here at stanford and one of her main um interventions with patients a brief intervention is just to to work with them to see if they're willing to do a month with no substances mm -hmm. and you know people you know it's to some degree have done i heard this has become popular like a was it like sober january or something like that mm -hmm. um and i'm not a i'm not a teetotaler by far i enjoy rum i like nice rums um but it's just a, an amazing thing to see how much how much happier my patients are and how much their mood improves and their cog you know i don't we haven't tested them cognitively I imagine cognitive performance would improve simply because what we know about the relationship between cognition and mood. Right. Um, but you know, just, just how being away from substances for a month helps them. So um, you can take or leave it, but that's something that has consistently impressed me with my patients and 
that I, I recommend to all the patients I see in the addiction clinic. Yeah. And so I'd be, I would be interested and I turn it around on you um, to see, yeah, see what would happen. I don't know if there's any studies for like a sober January just to see how, how people's cognitive performance changes, but, yeah. but that would be the, the one thing clinically that I've observed that I'd throw in the mix. Yeah, it'd certainly be interesting to look into. Um, and I know like, for instance, something that I see all the time talking about substance use and the impact on our on our lives. One, one thing that I think goes somewhat unexplored with a lot of healthy people, you know, outside of the hospital is the impact of substance use on sleep and how important sleep is for brain health and for mental health. Um, you know, the, the number of people across America who routinely have several drinks at night uh, and then, you know, have problems with their sleep quality uh, you know the some of the some of the relation that the alcohol uh, consumption in in extremes related to you know uh, decreasing the amount of REM sleep, for instance, um, yep. uh, is is an important consideration uh, for some people and for a lot of people. You know they sense that that it helps them to fall asleep more quickly, but the quality of the sleep suffers and and that can have downstream effects on Alzheimer's risk, for instance, and accumulation yeah. of amyloid you know, plaques. Yeah. And if you, if we take a step back and, you know, reframe our, our view of alcohol, of, you know, benzos, other substances, mm -hmm. in terms of what we talked about at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, as a society, you know, we might classify one thing as a medication, one thing as an illicit substance, one thing as a tolerable, you know, right. intoxicant, et cetera. But like at the end of the day, you know, the brain's perspective, brain doesn't care. You know, brain's perspective is like, what does it bind to? How does it exactly. change the way information moves through the brain? Mm -hmm. You know, how does homeostasis change in the short term and the long term, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, with, with a number of drinks and again, everybody's different, you fall asleep, pass out, if you will. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's an acute change in homeostasis in your brain where activity is amped up. So then as you metabolize the alcohol up, wake up earlier in the morning, your sleep quality is terrible. Um, yeah, so I agree. And as, as somebody who, you know, has a, a newborn, my sleep is not the best right now. And so I can, I can impress, I can assure you that there is a link between cognition and sleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, it didn't come through in our uh, interview today. So, <laughs> well, uh, well, it was great chatting with you, Dr. Fenno. Thank you so much for sharing this information. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about you, your work, or, you know, things you're interested in, is there anywhere that I can point them to? Oh, um, well, that's very kind of you. I mean, you can always go to our lab website. It's the Dysroth Lab. It's at Stanford. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we also maintain a, a resource website that's called Optogenetics. It's plural, optogenetics.org, O-R-G. Okay. Um, and then, you know, on the lab website, we have links to a lot of reviews that cover, you know, more broadly a lot of the aspects that we, we talked about today. Awesome. Well, thanks. Well, it was really great chatting with you, Dr. Fenno. Take yeah, care. thank you very much. You can find our other episodes at drnissen.com. You can also subscribe to our podcasts at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.